in the church now only because the kids are there and I still when I'm with my Catholic family spend time you know at the church but to me that that missing piece of not no longer believing means that I no longer feel a deeper connection to the church so to me the the church that I am in fact a member of does not feel like a spiritual home to me. It is a, a group of people, it is an organization that I care about, that I connect with, but I don't feel that I can use the term religious in the way that I interact with it. What does spiritual home be like? Well, I don't know. So for me, I think that I... It's been so long since I have had a, a belief that I considered to be religious or spiritual in any way that I'm not sure what that would look like to me. But I, for me, the closest thing to a spiritual home right now is something like this podcast. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the sort of political life of the mind is the kind of thing that feels closest to a spiritual home to me in a way that my interactions with either the church I belong to or any church really do not feel that way to me. Thank you. Those are very gracious answers to my sudden and nosy question. <laughs> you know, I, I have a master's degree in religious studies. It's not that I've never thought about these things. <laughs> uh, I think for my own part, just because, you know, my, our, my own preaching tradition uh, always has to include some sort of exhortation, uh, it would just be to all of those out there, and this is lifting up what Scott said at the very beginning, and, and I feel very deeply that to all those out there who do identify within the Christian left or liberal Christianity, to do so proudly, but to also not accept the premise that we have to be defined against the other as as as, as an other in the presence of some other more generally accepted Christianity. I think well, well, my boss uh, <laughs> at the seminary genuinely believes and often tells us that you know in 20 or 30 years it will be the more liberal christianity that has kind of taken the mantle of the, the most present and thriving and publicly visible christianity in the country for a variety of reasons it's partly just because you know he really likes the church and he's really liberal so <laughs> he's just hoping for the best but uh if we're going to move in that direction uh, i think it will be by really living into the idea that what we are embracing and what we are bringing to the public is not just the Christian left, but Christianity. This is our Christianity, and it is what it is. We believe it's good. We hope you do too. Welcome back, listeners. For this segment on the religious left, we have with us the Reverend Sarah Oglesby Dunnigan. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks. It's good to be with you. It's good to have you. Uh, Sarah is uh, a minister at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Topeka. So could you tell us a little bit about Unitarian Universalists? What do they believe? How do they worship? Sure. Sometimes I reference us as the far left end of the Protestant tradition, and we come out of the Reformation as a tradition that was Unitarian and a separate tradition that was Universalist. So those two traditions come together in the 60s after about a hundred years of trying to figure out how to do that. So we definitely come out of, you know, the Judeo-Christian way of worship and, and that sort of thing. But we are a pluralistic tradition these days, which means that in um, our congregations, we have a Protestant format where, you know, you have a sermon and hymns and an offering and children's story, but you might not have always scripture. You might have more secular sources, and the relationship to Jesus is more like a, a Reformed Judaism relationship, which is to say that many of us think he probably existed and did some amazing things, but not so much that he was an incarnation of God, although some of us 
are more Christian. So we have folks who consider themselves sort of liberal Christians, folks who consider themselves agnostics or Buddhists who want to have as part of their practice being in a church setting with folks on Sunday. We have folks who are atheists or non-theists is another way folks might think of themselves and folks who um, maybe connected to different traditions over time might used to have been Jewish or might have married somebody who has a different tradition than theirs and now they've ended up in a, a setting where they go to church or fellowship or a congregational meeting on Sundays that on the outside looks like a normal Protestant format but has more more adding into it a, a wider range of language for the holy, um, a wider set of spiritual practices, and that's sort of like open source religion. Tell us a little bit, if you don't mind, about your faith journey. How did you come to be a minister in the Unitarian Universalist Church? I grew up unchurched, so my experiences with church as a kid were when I spent the night at somebody's house on Saturday, um, maybe sometimes going to church with them, which was always weird since I was unchurched and didn't really know what these folks were doing (laughs) or why they were doing it. So until I was in my early 20s, I really didn't have an idea of what was even in the Bible. I didn't, I mean, I read a lot of literature that referenced the Bible, but I actually had a very loose understanding of what was being referenced. And when I was 21, my mom had started going to a Unitarian Fellowship in Denton, Texas, and I moved to Denton to finish college. And there was a women's group that met twice a month in the evening, which when you're 21 sounds a lot more doable than a 10.30 a.m. Sunday service. (laughs) (laughs) And I started going to that women's group, and they were really exploring the feminine divine across various traditions, and I found that to be intriguing and deepening, and they, they also worked with ritual and a lot of different ways of referencing the holy, but especially from a woman's perspective and so that kind of got me hooked and those women eventually convinced me that showing up at 10 30 on Sunday might be kind of interesting and turns out I thought it was and from that experience I began to you know show up to this partially lay-led congregation and occasionally would help somebody else lead service because when we didn't have a minister there that's what had to happen And that connected me into a wider set of Unitarian women in the Southwest area in Texas. And I connected with them through a regular conference that happened every year. I I don't know, just eventually I became somebody who identified as a Unitarian Universalist and who thought, hmm, I don't know, ministry sounds kind of interesting. But at the time, Mm -hmm. I was working in an urban community college in downtown Dallas and really liking the work that I was doing, and I worked with low-income first-generation college students, so I kept putting the whole ministry idea, like, well, maybe someday that might be something I do, and at some point, as I deepened and connected to what seemed to be my yearning or my call, ministry seemed to be the answer to that call, and I went to seminary. I think I did a lot of justice work along the way, and I really connected to the Holy through working on behalf of ending human suffering and environmental devastation. And that work led me to deepen my life as a Unitarian Universalist. Most um, folks in my tradition also connect deeply to justice work, to the idea of Mm -hmm. salvation in this life. So what can we do to make the world a better place for all of us now, as opposed to waiting for heaven? And at some point, that transition, I thought maybe if I went to seminary, I would maybe do nonprofit work or something, some kind of community organizing as a minister. But I eventually ended up serving a congregation here in Topeka, and I didn't have to choose. I've, I've done both a lot of justice work in the community and around the state, but also, you know, normal congregational work. So I'm interested that you were both in a very red state before and are now in a a pretty red state as well. Uh, And sort of exploring the idea that the, the ministry that you do, you know, is, is informing your social justice work. And, you know, do you think that people are coming to the idea of social justice and, and doing that sort of work through their religion or 
vice versa? Are they coming to the religion because they're interested in in doing this sort of work? Or are you know, is it is it not so straightforward as either one of those? You know, I think that for a long time for Unitarian Universalists who see themselves frequently as folks who aren't religious in quite the same way that other Christian traditions are. A lot of folks came to the social justice work as what they considered to be their spiritual practice or their religious work and were maybe uncomfortable with the idea of contemplative practices or spiritual deepening. And I think in the last 10 years, many of us have come to see how much those two pieces are the yin and yang and and need each other. That good um, justice work demands spiritual growth and grounding and reflection, and that a good, real deepening and spiritual reflection often leads us back out into the world because we are attending to our own healing and become aware of the healing that needs to happen in the world around us, and we have tools then to take out into that world. So I'm beginning to see both in terms of folks who used to be more prayers who want to become more doers and doers who have become more able to, even if they wouldn't call it prayer, to connect um, in a deeper way in relationship both with each other and with some sense of that which is greater than us, whether they would call it God or the Holy or spirit or the universe. I mean, people have lots of different language for it, right? It's not all Christ the healer for everyone, but, but I think, activists who don't ground themselves in some way burn out and we can't afford for that to happen right so my experience is that folks are beginning to see that that we need both pieces that idea of praxis that we're going to go do some work in the world and then we're going to sit down and reflect on it pray about it shift maybe internally and then go back out and do the work with a new deeper understanding of who we are doing the work with and why we are doing it and how it is changing us and healing us as well as offering healing to others. I see that shift has been happening, but I think in my spiritual community, which wouldn't always consider itself spiritual, might have considered itself more intellectual in some, some spaces, uh, the folks are beginning to see the, the need for integration of those two ideas of how we um, might be religious as a community differently. Could you talk a little bit about the ways in which Unitarian Universalists have been fighting for social justice? I know personally that uh, some of the Unitarian Universalists I know have been really active in immigration policy right now and helping immigrants and people targeted by ICE. Can you talk a little bit about some some sort of specific uh, things that people are doing? Sure. I would say grounded in the idea, two of our core principles, one of them is that there's inherent worth and dignity in all people, and that would translate to saying that all souls are sacred and worthy. And then this other sense that um, we're part of an interdependent web and that we inherently need each other, and not just us people, but the, the beings of the earth, that all things that are living are inherently interconnected. Those two concepts have really pushed us to see, first, the importance of uh, women as leaders to work in the 60s and 70s on LGBTQ issues and not really fully understanding the commitment we needed to make to those till the 80s and 90s. That work also connected into eventually work on immigration. The work of a group that we've affiliated with called Standing on the Side of Love really grew out of the Unitarian Universalist work in justice work. And that has connected us to immigration, to the environment, to racial justice, and to seeing all of those as being an, an LGBTQ rights and justice, that all of these, we're beginning to see the ways in which they interconnect. And so some churches may find in their community that immigration is where they really have spent a lot of time and energy becoming sanctuary churches or figuring out how to support other churches that are sanctuary or providing support to folks who are in detention centers. When I was in Denver, that was a big piece of the justice work that was happening. And, you know, as Ferguson unrolled and we began to have so much highlight on police violence and racial justice as being connected into this larger issue of policing, 
a lot of congregations also getting involved in uncovering the culture of white supremacy in our community 